Jeremy. No, sorry about that. Happy birthday Happy again. Birthday. <laughs> this is my granddad. I always knew he had had a successful career, but I'd never really taken the time to find out just how he got there, what journey he had been on. Today, my granddad turns 90, so it seemed the perfect time to find out. On the 29th of November, 1930, my grandfather, Alan Lee Williams, was born. Alan is a former president of the Atlantic Treaty Association, British Labour Party politician, writer, and professor of politics at Queen Mary University of London. We grew up, uh, first of all, in Deptford, which is alongside the river, because my father was a waterman and lighterman, easier to get to work from there. But in 1936, we moved uh, up the hill, as we called it, uh, to 22 Mayday Gardens, in, which was part of Blackheath. This is where my granddad spent most of his early teens as a lighterman, working the barges, transferring explosives, coal and other materials, sometimes not knowing when the job would end. Like his father before him, Alan became a lighterman on the River Thames at the tender age of 14 years old. During his time as a lighterman, he encountered challenges of various different proportions. The greatest challenge to, uh, I, I found was fog, because they were pea super fogs. You couldn't see it in front of your own eyes. And I was waiting to get into the West India Dock to go along to go alongside a ship to take the ship's cargo into my barge and then wait for orders from the office as to where I should take it. But of course when um, I moored up uh, I, I could hardly see my way walking along the gunwale. But in the cabin there was coal uh, and paper and so on. Uh, all, the lighterman always carried matches. So I started a lovely fire and logs, but it was mostly coal, because uh, that was slow burning. Wood burns too quickly. And it, oh, it was lovely. And I got my piece of bread out and a lump of cheese, made cheese on toast. <laughs> we knew they were coming. In fact, we did hear the German planes when they reached Gravesend. During the time of the declaration of war, Alan, his brother Geoffrey, and friend John Bray decided to create a plane that would resemble a Spitfire. So we decided that if the German planes were, gave us a quarter of an hour, why don't we build a plane which could fly and we'd shoot them down? <laughs> so we started to build a plane and we built it in um, John Bray's mother's bedroom or uh, his bedroom in his mother's house and um, and had a great difficulty getting it out we had to dismantle it <laughs> start again so we were a bit behind the times that we wanted to shoot German planes but we did um, decide a change of tactic Instead of trying to build a Spitfire with RAF things, we thought it would be better, since it wouldn't fly very well and it was going to crash, to make it a Nazi plane. <laughs> so, so we had swastikas. Well, we didn't know anything about the law at the time, but swastikas were banned, strictly banned. You couldn't use them. And um, so we got it to the top of Sh Shooter's Hill, because it's a one in seven job there. It's a big hill and John Bray sat in it and we pushed him and <laughs> well he didn't even take off <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it all started to fall apart which John Bray sitting in it exposing the wheels which were from a prams prams we discovered the policeman Sergeant Tolbury from 
met Walton Priest at the bottom of the hill, also turned up and saw the swastika and said, oh, oh, oh get rid of this, get rid of this. it's against the law. <laughs> so, but he lived, he was a neighbour of ours, so we were friendly with him. And we had a lot of time for him because he was a very brave man. When we were bombed out, it killed um, the exact numbers I can give you, I can't remember them now, about 20, killed a number of our school friends. But it killed about 18 people. Um, and he was a big strong man, so he was able to lift up the whole area where he stood. And my father pulled bodies out. Some were alive, some were dead. So we had a lot of time for Sergeant Tilbury. Being a member of parliament for 15 years meant that family time for Alan was sometimes hard to come by. I tried. It's hard to, to do that. Member of Parliament it doesn't give you much, particularly if you have a majority of one, or even if you've got a majority of a hundred. You're, you're, it's very difficult to, to always be at home. So you are known for your absence rather than your presence. By 1967, Alan was appointed Parliamentary Private Secretary to Dennis Healy, MP, in his role as Defence Secretary in Northern Ireland, in a period where a threat under shadow was brewing from the IRA. Yes, uh, we, we had to have a police officer living in here. Um, and I wasn't allowed to drive my own car, they drove my car. Um, yes, they'd found, the Guardian discovered it, they, they'd found the diary or got information from the police about a diary reference to my car number where it was parked outside there. So that warranted me being um, <coughs> having a guard because I was then private parliamentary secretary to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. So it was a real, a real call. Um, uh, but um, the police used to go underneath the car fessing in the morning and uh, then on one evening, Penelope came back late from a party she'd been at. And so when Miranda came in and I said, well, are we all present? Miranda said, oh yes, we're all back. So I assumed that to be Penelope being uh, with, with included in that number. And then in about one o'clock in the morning, perhaps between one and five, I couldn't tell you exactly, I'll ask Penelope, she might give me a better indication. Um, I then came downstairs and saw the policeman saying, I am a police officer, if you move I will shoot. And then, of course, Pepe didn't respond, nonsense. <laughs> And, and the fact that he didn't shoot meant said, I, I, I don't think I can't do this job because I should have shot her. Alan played a role in supporting the negotiations of START I and II treaties with Russia and America. He was present when Ronald Reagan was being advised on the negotiations from a NATO perspective. START I was a bilateral treaty between the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics on the reduction and limitation of strategic offensive arms. There were 12 original NATO countries Today, there are 28. Seven of those are former Warsaw Pact countries. Each member of NATO has an equal say in discussions and decisions. One of the most important principles of the NATO Treaty is Article 5. It states that an attack on one country is in theory an attack against all members. I became a, a director of a body called the Atlantic Council. and. Um, and I was uh, appointed as director of this body. Um, so uh, it meant that I organized visits to NATO, either for specialists or for people who didn't know very much about NATO, had two different kinds of groups. And I always used to go, so I, when I, I listened to all their briefings, I organized for a group of Americans from to who were members of the English speaking union I was, then I was although I, I'd ceased to be the Atlantic Council 
I then became Director General of the English Speaking Union of the Commonwealth. And so I invited him to come and to meet these people. And he, he turned out when I first met him. Um, but the, the, um, most of them were young women and they screamed just as if he were, you know, a, a oh, they punched him, clawed him. So he said, can you help me? <laughs> so I had to push in and stop it, you know. If you want to speak, speak to Prince Charles, speak to him. Don't touch him. Oh, hello, Jeremy. No, uh, sorry about that. Happy birthday again. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you for, uh, Thank you for sending your card. I, I'm not sure what we did, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was very good. You must have been a bit of <laughs> Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Alan is sharing his 90th birthday with his family via video call. Happy birthday to you. Yes, thank you very much. Day to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear granddad. Happy birthday to you.